Hello, and welcome to show number 2407 of Eyes on Success, a weekly program covering a wide variety of topics of interest to people with vision loss. I'm Nancy Goodman Torpy. And I'm Pete Torpy. I think AI can help with uh, daily tasks and help with mobility and will help with a lot of other things that we haven't even imagined right now. And this is just another example of how AI can improve the lives of the visually impaired. In this case, it's for navigation. Now, the technology used in self-driving cars comes to a smart harness worn by the blind to warn of obstacles and assist in navigating using a combination of GPS and audio feedback. We'll talk with co-founder and CEO Mael Fabian about the development of the biped device, the technology behind it, and how it works. But first for our tip of the week. This week's tip comes from Mael Fabian and is about another piece of access technology. Be My Eyes launched Be My AI. Uh, I was in, you know, having a chat with some of the people in the in the team, but uh, I think the use of uh, of basically of uh, open AI technology for vision and for like scene description is going to change uh, quite a bit of things. So I would say uh, paying attention to to this field and reading a couple of articles and maybe trying out what they've built uh, because I think it's uh, definitely going to help a lot based on the the articles that I've seen uh, written about their technology. You are listening to Eyes on Success. 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 Let's start by meeting Mael and learning about Biped, the company. My name is Mael Fabian. Uh, I am French. I live in Switzerland, uh, in the French-speaking side in Lausanne, uh, and I co-founded a startup named Biped.ai. Now, I have to admit, we're always talking about how gorgeous Colorado is where we live, but Lausanne is at least as beautiful. I would have to agree. I haven't been to Colorado yet, but uh, I'd love to go. Um, but yeah, Lausanne is, is definitely on the, I would say, top of the uh, cities that I've visited in Europe. And before we get into the details of talking about Biped, give us a quick 15-second summary of what Biped is and what the company does. So Biped is a harness worn on the shoulders that can detect obstacles for blind and visually impaired users. And it can also provide GPS navigation. So it's a, a mobility device uh, that we develop. And you and your partner are engineers by training, right? Absolutely. Yeah, we, we've put a team of uh, robotics engineers mostly. Um, we'll get into the details, I guess, uh, afterwards of, of how that works. But um, we're mostly replicating what self-driving cars do. So we, we work with robotics engineers. We're a small team of six for now. Eyes on Success connects corporate sponsors with visually impaired listeners around the world. More information about becoming a sponsor can be found at www.sponsor.eyesonsuccess.net. This week's focus topic is Biped the Device, a navigation tool that incorporates technology used in self-driving cars with GPS and audio feedback to provide information about your route and any obstacles in your path. Well, let's start off by talking about what the inception was for this idea and how long ago you started the company. So the idea came around in uh, summer 2020, um, and at the time I... I was already living in Lausanne. I met a, a blind person who was uh, cr uh, crossing the street and who was actually doing a FaceTime call to a friend. And his friend was helping him avoid key elements uh, on the street because he was crossing a, one of the intersections that are very hard, you know, lots of uh, electric scooters and bicycles and things like that. And uh, you can think a bit of uh, like Be My Eyes, uh, but for, for mobility somehow is, is the setup he came up with. And so I just thought that there had to be a way to basically use artificial intelligence to to try to help and you know understand what his friend is is doing on the other side of the FaceTime call, what he was highlighting as potential dangers. And that was the very beginning of the project, so about three years ago now. And I met my co-founder shortly after, and we created the company in January 2021. And what were you doing before that? 
I was enrolled in a PhD uh, at EPFL, uh, so that's the Polytechnic School in in Lausanne. Um, so engineering focused. Um, I was doing actually, I, I was working on something completely unrelated, but there was a signal processing, uh, so a speech understanding in criminal conversations was the topic of my PhD. I was trying to analyze what bad guys were saying over the phone uh, in an automatic way to try to uh, establish. Uh, yeah, like uh, see if AI could could help in any sense there uh, on a research project. But yeah, that was that was quite unrelated. Oh wow! So biped was your first venture into commercial businesses outside of school. How exciting! It was actually my second. I launched my first startup when I was nineteen, and I ran that for about three years. And that was a, a van rental platform. So van and motorhomes. Is, is the first thing I, I launched as a platform and run that until the end of my master's. And, and then, yeah, jumped to the PhD and right out of the PhD, started Biped. Well, from the description, it sounds like Biped has a lot in common with self-driving cars and you're using similar techniques and uh, technologies to do this for blind people walking around. So tell us a little bit about the technology and, and how it works. Sure. So the, the harness itself is about two pounds. It's worn on the shoulders and it has a set of cameras located on the left side of your chest. So we'd have uh, three small cameras uh, looking on the left, front and right. Uh, and so this is a camera module on the left side of the chest. Then there is a small computer on the right side of the chest and a battery pack behind the, the neck. And then there are like flexible straps that go around your your shoulders. And the main thing about the device is that in case there is a danger incoming, it will produce a sound feedback in the headphones. Um, we are also working on, on uh, vibration feedback. But uh, the sound feedback is just like a beep, 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 beep kind of interface, like a parking assist. The, the way it works inside is actually quite interesting because we think of obstacles not in terms of distance as a classic, I would say, ultrasound or, or laser sensor, but in terms of movement. So if you are about like a couple of feet behind someone, but you're walking at the same speed, there's no real reason that you know this person should be considered as a as an obstacle. Except the second this person actually stops and you keep you know walking towards this person, then this person becomes a potential obstacle on your trajectory. And so what the device is doing is really kind of replicating at a at a small level what self driving cars do. So it's detecting the obstacles. It's trying to predict whether something will be on your trajectory later or not, which uh, basically allows it to anticipate in cases there are like, you know, dangerous obstacles, but also to tone down or like not even warn you about things that are not dangerous at all. Because, you know, bicycles just like, for example, going uh, going away and there is no risk of collision directly. So that's a bit the, the paradigm that we're trying to follow. Oh, that's interesting. So you don't get overwhelmed with extraneous data. You just really get alerted to things that are of interest to you or should be of interest to you. Yeah. And I assume you described the physical device and it sounds like it's well balanced and not all that heavy. I assume that you've tried wearing this around for, you know, a long time. Is it reasonably comfortable? It's it's usually the number one feedback that we get is that the you know the device feels when you touch it heavier than it actually is when you wear it on your shoulders and and that's uh we've now had people wear it for like a consecutive six seven hours and not complain at all about how it feels on the shoulders so I think uh, it's about two pounds um, so it's really a fraction of the the, the weight of a of a backpack typically. Um, and the, the pads that we have, like the, the, the straps that are flexible on your shoulders, have a, a built-in metal structure that can really adapt to the shape of your body. And, and usually that makes it quite comfortable to, to wear for a continuous amount of time. And what is the battery life? So uh, you can swap batteries. Each battery is about three hours of continuous use. Um, so it would be three hours spent uh, outdoor walking. But we've had people get to the end of, uh, you know, like uh, we, we deliver with two batteries. So we've had people get to the end of the, the two batteries in a, in a single day. Um, so that would be about, yeah, seven hours of, uh, of walk. So that's a, <laughs> a long hike uh, somehow. But yeah, and in that case, we can just uh, accommodate and, and deliver additional batteries if needed. 
So it seems to me in the self-driving car paradigm, the CPU that's making decisions about whether an object is potentially going to be a dangerous item or something you might interact with, that has to make decisions about what to do and act on them. But in the biped model, the CPU is making all these decisions and then the human has to act on the information. Is there a reason why you would not invoke speech so that biped would tell the human there's a bicycle in front of you and it just stopped? Yeah, I think it's it's a great question. The um, the thing is, technically, we we could play speech, right? And I'm not saying we will never do speech as a type of feedback because we we have the understanding of what you know that there is a, a bicycle on the right and that there is a car on the left. It has like a, a object uh, recognition uh, capabilities um, built in. But what we've seen is that in terms of audio interface, it's a lot more confusing as if you start saying bicycle right three o'clock and then uh you know 20 feet for example um because that is a lot slower to pronounce than a single unified interface that would be beep 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 beep, beep for the end user so this is mostly you know based on on preferences and, and we have some people who prefer having speech and we're working on you know on specific speech feedback for specific people we have people who have um, hearing impairments, in which case we can also work with, you know, other types of audio feedback or vibration feedback. Now, the line that we didn't want to cross is to tell to the person, and you highlighted this pretty well, it's tell the, tell to the person where they should go. That's why we work in collaboration with the user rather than trying, as the self-driving car is doing, to take the decision autonomously. Um, and in that case, we would just say, you know, whatever way we, we give the feedback, there is an obstacle in front. Um, but then it's up to the person with the cane uh, training or with the guide dog usage to be able to go around the obstacle. But we won't like tell the person that they should then step on the left and go around the obstacle and then resume their path on the other side. You just hinted at an important factor. You're suggesting that a person who's using biped is also going to be using a white cane or a dog. Yeah, yeah, and we're we're really strong believers in the complementarity of of these two solutions. Um, we have worked extensively with mobility trainers, with occupational therapists, and we do really think that for many reasons, including you know just the purpose of signaling a visual impairment, um, it is very important if the person is using something that we actually do not intend to replace anything. The person's not using anything in daily mobility. You know, fine, biped can, I think, be a great help. But um, there is no intention behind the project, you know, as of now, to, to try to replace anything. So if one is walking around with a cane or a dog, a cane catches certain obstacles, usually things that are pretty close to you on the ground, but it may not catch things overhead or tell you what's coming from the side. And, you know, dogs can get around certain obstacles and stuff. How does the biped sort of complement what the person is getting from their other navigation aids? What obstacles are you detecting or what situations are you telling the user about that they wouldn't ordinarily get from these other devices? Um, so typically to take the example of, of how we come as a complement to Kane, as you highlighted, Kane is going to pick up obstacles that are waist level and, and below. Um, we typically capture everything up to head level. Um, so even if an obstacle is about one inch at the head level, that would typically be in the range of what biped can capture. Uh, Low-hanging branches, traffic signs, tailgates, uh, mirrors of a you know truck as you're walking on a sidewalk, uh, doors or marketing signs or anything um, that would be in this range. I've run into enough of those using a cane. Yeah. <laughs> even using his wife. You don't get warned about those. I'm just a little bit shorter than Pete, and I usually try to anticipate if something's high enough for me to get under, but not for him to get under. I try to tell him, but sometimes I must misjudge. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, it's it's one of the uh, the first features we developed was you know detect head level things, but as if you had a virtual shield, you know, in front of you, in that sense of. You can tailor the detection to your height also. So there is like a smartphone app where you can control everything that is accessible on iOS and, and Android. 
yeah, what the main parameter you can set is basically your height, so that if you're six foot tall, then it's gonna it's not going to pick up uh, basically obstacles that are like you know seven feet and above. Uh, but then if you're shorter, then we can also discard any type of obstacle that you're not going to hit. Um, and so I think this gives the right amount of, of signal somehow, which is usually appreciated. And then in terms of uh, complementarity with a with a guide dog. The thing that um, people highlight when they use biped as a complement to a dog is that it somehow explains why the dog might be making a certain decision. And to be honest, like we are building AI so that at one point in time, it becomes as smart as a dog, right? That it's able to understand the scene, that it's able to to act upon the, the information that it captured from the scene. But the fact of knowing that your dog stopped because there is something, um, you know, a couple of feet away or that there is an incoming vehicle or something like this is is always interesting um so we we really work on the complementarity to the pain by trying to expand the field of view by trying to anticipate if there will be a risk of collision later based on movement so we can capture things a bit further than other uh, sensors um, can and uh, by trying to explain why the dog might be making certain decisions as an example, if one is walking along with their cane and you're passing by a big truck mirror that may be sticking out at head level that the cane doesn't catch, the biped obviously warns you that there's something in front of you. But do you have any idea whether it's right in front of you and head height or leg height or it's right in front of you and you should just veer totally around? What kind of feedback do you get? So the, the sounds can be actually quite precise. Um, so we have we have two main features on the sounds. Uh, I would say three: the the volume basically uh, and the and the frequency at which we repeat the sound tells you how close the obstacle is. So of course, if you have something like beep 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 beep, that means that the obstacle is fairly close to you. Then using a spatial effect, we have like a three D effect that we apply to the sound, so you can hear it coming slightly from the left or slightly from the right, for example. Or if it's coming completely from the left or from the right, then you will hear it clearly coming from these directions. But it has like a very nice 3D um, audio understanding that helps a lot identify where the obstacle is located. So you would know which way to veer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the, the final thing would be um, to reflect that an obstacle is uh, head level. Um, we actually change around the pitch of the, the sound. Um, so if the, 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 the obstacle is at the head level, there would be a higher pitch uh, beep. And then if it's a ground level obstacle, there would be a lower pitch um, kind of beep. Oh, so you put a lot of thought into how the f- user gets feedback from this. Absolutely, yeah. How did you test the system? We designed it actually with uh, the ophthalmic hospital in Lausanne. We were extremely lucky to find them and they were very welcoming. So we had we enrolled a group of, of beta testers from the very beginning on. And then we contacted the Swiss Federation for the Blind um, and, and um, most of the local associations. So we worked with, um, I would say, up to 250 beta testers at scale. Um, and that, I think, allowed us to gather basically the feedback of, of a lot of people we soon realized that, you know, there is hardly a one-fits-all kind of solution, but we try to do our best in, in this understanding. It is difficult. Everybody has different needs and desires and different ways of using devices. I guess you have to test with a fair number of people and see how users are actually going to use the devices. Absolutely, yeah. Do you make special accommodations for people with hearing loss issues? We do start doing that. So we have one setting in, in the smartphone app that allows you to pair uh, hearing aids, for example, or cochlear implants. In that case, there is a specific sound set that removes very high frequency sounds and replaces it with something that is in the audible spectrum. And we are aware that that might not be enough depending on the degree of hearing loss. And so in that case, we started working with a company manufacturing um, haptic bracelets. Uh, and so it's like wristbands that are wearing on the left and on the right, and they can basically vibrate. Um, and so they would be like you connect them to your device and then they would start to be um, triggered as an obstacle is coming. And then you can play a bit around like knowing if the obstacle is coming from the left or from the right, depending on which uh, wristband is activated. It's a bit of a simpler feedback. It's the beginning of the collaboration with this uh, company, but uh, we've had a couple of uh, requests going in this direction and I think it's a good evolution to bring. 
as a new device, then it sounds like you're always introducing new features that could be helpful and all. And I understand you just introduced a GPS feature. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so we try to do updates every month on average. So if you're a user, you get basically a smartphone notification to tell you there is a new update available. And the two features of the month are uh, hole detection. Um, so the the that's like one of the core features that we worked on is being able to detect big drop-offs or holes in the ground. Um, so those might be yeah, staircases, uh, train platforms, or things that you know put you at risk of falling and have a specific sound triggered for this. And the second one that was uh, a longer way to it also by our team uh, was uh, uh, is a GPS feature. And so directly from the smartphone application, you can save predefined uh, favorite destinations, but you can also type new ones. And then it provides uh, basically turn-by-turn navigation inside of the same headphones you're using for um, obstacle avoidance, basically. And basically, this is going to evolve a lot. Um, but so far, it tells you a couple of feet before the turn, uh, it tells you, uh, you know, so that you can anticipate the turn you're going to have to make. And if you have to make like a sharp left kind of turn, you hear the next instruction coming from, you know, sharp left. And then if it's, uh, instead of telling you turn right, if it's a very like gentle kind of a turn, you also hear it nearly from right in front of you, but slightly on the right. Um, so that's the first implementation we have of the GPS. But I think it it's helps with the, aspect of you know, building an all-in-one kind of device. So that's great. With the combination of the GPS that tells you, in general, where to go, go straight, turn right, whatever, you also get the fine details of, well, turn right, but not right now, because if you do, you'll hit a wall. Yeah, yeah. And I think this, this uh, like the, the cameras themselves have a like specific range. They would look up to 50 feet, basically. And then the GPS itself has a certain level of precision, right? And the GPS is never perfect. So it might be off by like 10 feet, for example. And so I think these two sensors definitely have a good complementarity uh, in terms of understanding of, of the surroundings. When I think of starting a new tech company these days, I think, you know, it's probably often easier to start a software company because it's not very capital intensive. But with the kinds of GPUs to make the AI run that you need for this device, that can be a pretty expensive proposition. How did you develop the funding for this program? Yeah, it's, I mean, sometimes I wish I started a SaaS company also. <laughs> but uh, it's it's definitely challenging. Um, but we were lucky to find a good pool of investors. So I think Switzerland has a couple of great innovation programs to promote hardware innovation. Switzerland is quite known for its med tech, biotech, kind of uh, industry uh, and its links uh, with engineering schools. So that allowed us to to find the first half million, basically, to take the project off the ground. And then it's true that the disability tech is not the market that usually appeals uh, or attracts, I would say, the m- most investors. But we were able to find, a, I would say, a great set of uh, mission-driven investors, um, business angels who supported us. And we have so far raised two funding rounds um, that allowed us to basically grow a team of uh, of about six right now um, and launch the product. But yeah, that's uh, so far our experience. And you guys have made a lot of progress pretty quickly, it sounds like. How long has the product actually been for sale? About seven months now in, in Europe. And we are shipping the first units in the U.S. these days. So yeah, we... we as we incorporated the company in January 2021, we started shipping the first units beginning of 2023. So we tried to stay on a two years R&D cycle and then start selling uh, as early as we could to get live field feedback. Now, one obviously can't test these out, go down to their local Target or Best Buy and check it out. How can one demo such a device or know that they might be able to make use of it? couple of options because i mean of course we are trying to grow the local presence of our devices a bit all around the, the globe and with the focus on the on the us these days um so the first thing is we have a free test uh, program so we do uh, subscriptions on the device and then you have a first month of a free trial we have seen that as like a good option for people to try to test the device and then return it if it's not a fit the second one is a couple of conferences and events. So we'll be going to CSUN 
uh, in March. I think, if I'm not mistaken, the dates are 18th to the 22nd of March. So that will be one of the in-person demos that we'll be able to do. And then we're also growing the list of uh, distributors that we're working with um, and a couple of uh, low vision um, centers um, that we're trying to establish partnerships with so that they can have also one unit. Well, great. I wish you guys success with this very creative and innovative product that makes use of some of the latest technologies that are available to us these days. Thank you very much. You are listening to Eyes on Success. Success, 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 success. Now for this week's final item, how to learn more about Biped and how to contact them. Well, if people would like to find out more about Biped, perhaps test it out or anything else, what would you tell them to do? Um, we have all the info on our website. Um, so the address is biped.ai, so B-I-P-E-D dot A-I. And then uh, we try to accommodate as uh, much as possible um, for you know live demos uh, requests. So just uh, shooting us an email is usually the best best option, uh, and that would be on hello at biped.ai. Is there a way people can check out the app that they would be using before purchasing a device? Absolutely. So on the App Store, um, we have our app. It's just named Biped App uh, in the search bar. And you can actually do the uh, the training um, because we have a mandatory training program where we play a couple of uh, like we we try to give the feedback on what what the sound would be like if you start using biped in in real life. Um, so you can also get a first experience there, and that usually takes fifteen to twenty minutes to to solve, and then you can see uh, at first if it's a potential fit with what you have in mind. And is this available for Android devices as well as iOS devices? Absolutely, yes. You can find all of that contact information as usual in the show notes associated with this episode, which is episode 2407 at our website, www.eyesonsuccess.net. That's it for today's show. Next week on Eyes on Success, we'll be talking about the Disability in Medicine Mutual Mentorship Program, or DM3P a grassroots organization that supports disabled healthcare professionals and trainees as they navigate the field of medicine. We'll talk with members Aaron Jarrell and Suchita Rastogi about why and how the organization was formed and how its members benefit each other. Thanks for joining us this week. Tell a friend about Eyes on Success, and we hope you'll all join us next week. You've been listening to Eyes on Success, hosted and produced by Nancy Goodman Torpy and Peter Torpy. You can access the full archive of previous shows, subscribe to the podcast, and much more by going to our website, www.eyesonsuccess.net. If you have questions about anything you've heard on the show or have suggestions for future shows, send an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.